Hello and good morning delegates and dear faculties. I welcome you all to the day two of IHGCon 2022. I would request our first chairperson, first session chairperson for UGI cancer, Dr. Yogesh Vasist, Dr. C. Khandelwal, Dr. Pankaj Sonar, and Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay to please join us on stage for the chair. Good morning. I welcome you all to today's first session of Upper GI Cancer. We are starting with this topic, minimally invasive gastrectomy for locally advanced gastric cancer. Is it the standard of care? The speaker is Dr. Tsuyoshi Eto. Dr. Eto, please. He's not here, so. I don't think he is here. Okay. Let us go to the second topic. Yeah. Let's go to the second topic. Sewer type 2 G junction carcinoma. Esophagectomy versus gastrectomy. What is the choice? Our speaker is Dr. Florian Gabuar from the University of Cologne, Germany. Dr. Gabuar, please. Committee, thank you very much for the kind invitation here to Kolkata. So it's a great honor for me. It's the first time for me being in India. And um, so as you might know, I'm from Germany, from Cologne. It's a city in the far western part of Germany. We are the largest center for upper GI surgery in Germany. And I was kindly asked um, by the congressman um, to talk about G-junction type 2 tumors. So. As you might know, there are several challenges in the diagnosis, staging, and treatment of G-junction type 2 tumors. So um, it begins with the right diagnosis by endoscopy. You know, the, the, the definition is clear-cut with a center of the tumor within one to three centimeters um, above or below the GE junction. And you can imagine if you have a large tumor, it's not that easy to define what is the tumor center and what is the direction in which the tumor grows. So the real type 2 tumors are a rare condition to, to define it on itself. <clears throat> the second point is how to stage those, um, those tumors. In the AGCC current, um, current TNM staging system, they are considered as esophageal cancers, but however, some still think they are a more gastric cancers than esophageal cancer. So we'll show you in a second um, what we think is the best way to stage. And of course, the, the topic of neoadjuvant therapy or perioperative therapy, should they, those tumors considered as gastric or esophageal cancer? And of course, the surgical approach um, has to be, to be discussed. In the end, I can summarize now, there are more questions than answers on, on this topic. And of most of the questions, there's no real evidence how to um, treat those tumors. So to start with the um, staging system, there are slight differences between the esophageal and gastric cancer staging, especially in um, stage two and three. As you see in the gastric cancer, there are early cancers, T1 tumors with um, advanced lymph node stages that are considered as type two. My former colleagues from Hamburg in Germany analyzed their type 2 tumors and put them after the, the eighth um, AGCC definition um, TNM in, either in the esophageal or gastric cancer classification system. What you can see here that the type 2 tumors might be a little better grouped in the esophageal cancer group. Here you can see this on the left side, especially the differentiation between the type uh, stage 2 and 3 is a bit more better, obviously, than as gastric cancer. So I think the, 
the suggestion or recommendation to stage those tumors as esophageal cancers might be the, the better part. The big topic is the, the neoadjuvant therapy whenever your patient need this. Should those patients treat it with chemoradiation or chemotherapy alone? You all know the cross trials that established the chemoradiation therapy by the Dutch group almost 10 years ago and there has recently published the 10 year follow up and you can see there is a benefit of the chemoradiation compared to upfront surgery even in the long term survival on the far right side. But however you know the benefit is not that much and especially for adenocarcinoma in the original publication it was almost not hit the significant levels. So um, there is a benefit on survival, but it's not that much we all um, hoped that, um, that days. So in contrast, the neoadjuvant therapy, these are the data from the FLOT4 trial, establishing the FLOT regimen as perioperative therapy. Um, the trial was um, six, eight years from now um, established in Germany. And they showed a clear benefit of overall survival compared to the old matrix um, regimen. Um, but however, the, the, the main advantage is the less toxicity compared to the matrix um, to the matrix protocol. So the question is, what is better, chemoradiation or chemotherapy for those um, tumors? There are only limited data on head-to-head -head, um, comparison. And uh, last year in the ESCO, John Reynolds from a Ireland presented for the first time the new Agus um, data, they compared chemoradiation, the cross protocol according to, um, um, against chemotherapy. The shortcoming on this study is they started with magic and changed to flood during the study. So there is a mixture in the, in the chemotherapy arm, but however, in the end, there is no difference between chemoradiation and chemotherapy in this trial. So we performed a similar study in Germany just directly compared FLOT to CROSS, the recruitment completed in February this year, and we expect the data on the ASCO 2023 next year. So it would be really interesting to see what kind of neoadjuvant therapy is beneficial for the patient in the end. So coming to the main question, the, the type of surgery. Um, there are two, um, two kind of operations. You can do either the esophagectomy when you consider a type 2 tumor as esophageal cancer or an extended gastrectomy. The question is, the extent of the lymph node resection, can you perform it properly? Resection margin, of course, the post-operative course of the patient um, morbidity and mortality and the quality of life, of, co of course. Coming to the lymph node dissection, and this is one of the key questions, I think. Study from Perium from 2015 analyzed for type 1 and type 2 tumors the amount of positive lymph nodes in the mediastinum um, after transthoracic esophagectomy. And what you can see here, and I think this is common sense, in the type 2 tumors, in the end, there are one quarter of the patients positive with mediastinal lymph nodes in the end. But what you can see on the right side, even on type 2 tumors, when you treat them with a transthoracic esophagectomy, you find in 10% of the patients mediastinal lymph nodes, high mediastinal lymph nodes, you cannot reach from below from just an abdominal approach. So this could suggest that a transthoracic esophagectomy might be beneficial in res with respect to the lymph node dissection, um, as you can see here. A study from Japan analyzed if there is a, a correlation between the length of the tumor in the, in, in the esophageal part um, and mediastinal lymph nodes. And what they revealed is that beginning with a tumor length of 30 millimeters, 3 centimeters growth into the esophagus, there is a significant increase in mediastinal lymph nodes itself. So, three centimeter tumor growth in the esophagus, you should consider or think if this is a feasible approach with an extended gastrectomy, even if, it's, if this tumor is considered as type two junction tumor. But I think this is again an, an evidence that those tumors might profit from a transthoracic selective lymph adenectomy in the end. But as I said, the evidence 
how to operate those patients is very low. A study from the Dutch group um, a few years ago um, mixed all their type 1 to type 3 tumors and analyzed just the, the type 2 tumors and they found 180 patients. What you can see in the, in the last line, from, the, from those 180 patients in, in the Netherlands, only one, 21 were treated by gastrectomy. So their standard approach is the transthoracic esophagectomy. Interestingly, you have to think, this is the Dutch group, they established the cross protocol, but even those patients received in the 50% almost only chemotherapy. This is a bit strange in the study um, because they are big fans of the chemoradiation and almost 40% uh, received no adjuvant, uh, new adjuvant treatment at all. So in the end, <coughs> in this study, they come to the conclusion that the patients might profit from the esophagectomy, but you have to think that um, only 21 patients were treated by gastrectomy, so there must be reasons in the decision from the surgeon why those patients were treated by gastrectomy as the esophagectomy is their standard approach in this study. The so far largest trial comes from the group of Charisse Makar from the King's College in London, and they analyzed the, the US SEER database with around 9,600 patients. And they compared 1,000 esophagectomies to 8,600 gastrectomies. The, the cohorts were not comparable in, um, at the beginning, and they put a lot of effort in matching procedures. Um, because what you can see here in the red box, um, the, the kind of, or the, the fraction of patients that received new adjuvant therapy um, differed significantly at the beginning. So they tried to annihilate this, um, at, the, at, this um, at the matching procedure. Interestingly, what you can see, this is over the time the, the procedure is performed in the US. And you can see there is an increase in the esophagectomy. It's a smaller block box um, compared to the gastrectomy that decreases a bit over the years. <coughs> they revealed similar results as the, the group um, from, um, from Richard van Hilgersberg in the um, Netherlands. And in this analysis, the esophagectomy was better before on the left side and after matching as well and on the right side. But there are, I think, some, some points you have to consider in this study. Even after matching, the groups differed significantly in the tumor stage and the lymph node stage, and especially, and this is interesting, in the resection margin stage. You can see on the last line here, the R0 resection was um, um, or the R1 resection rate was 9.3% in the gastrectomy um, group, and I think this is unacceptable high, um, almost 10% uh, R1 resection um, in those tumors. So um, in Germany, we're faced with the, with the same questions, how to operate these patients, and we um, initiated from Colonas the, the CARDIA trial comparing directly those two, um, two kinds of operations, either the transthoracic um, esophagectomy compared to the extended gastrectomy. So patients can be included um, with G-junction type 2 tumors. They have to be pre-treated with um, FLOT only because um, we won't um, include uh, hemoradiation patients there. And then they undergo randomization one-to-one, -one, either to a transthoracic esophagectomy with gastric pull-up and intrathoracic anastomosis or a extended gastrectomy. So this is the extent of lymph node dissections um, that is mandatory um, during the operation, either on the left side <coughs> with the transthoracic esophagectomy or the extended gastrectomy, which is a standard D2 lymph node dissection, except of the pre-aortal um, um, lymph nodes on the stage 110, what you can see here. So um, the recruitment is fine. Um, we expect the first results end of next year, and um, I will be uh, really confident that we find out what kind of operation is best for the patient. So what's done in the world? So I think this is interesting. This is a global survey um, performed a few years from the Dutch group and 
on the far left side, you can see um, for type 2 tumors, it's um, here in the middle. In the world, the extended gastrectomy is the choice to be um, what is done. So the esophagectomy has no real, um, um, it's not the standard of care um, if you look around the world. It differs significantly between the, group and the, the uh, areas, regions in the world. It's, you can see here in Asia, the extended gastrectomy is by far the largest um, group changes um, to Europe and the um, Northern America where the esophagectomy is far more common for these type of tumors. Interestingly, and a question I cannot answer exactly, when you look at the individual surgeon volume, um, the gastrectomy is performed more often in those surgeons um, that consider themselves as high volume surgeons. Um, I would have been expected that with a higher experience and higher volume, the, um, the esophagectomy becomes more common even for larger tumors. I can only think because the, the, there are, as you know, some really, really high volume centers in Asia, especially in China, and I can think that those high groups of um, gastrectomy might confound these results a bit, but I'm not sure, and this is not mentioned the paper as well. So I come to my end and I think in the end there are more questions than answers today. You can do both. It's not wrong to do either a gastrectomy or an esophagectomy, but we do not know exactly what is better in the end. Um, in Cologne, we, outside the study, we treat those patients um, as well as esophagectomy and by esophagectomy. Um, but I think you should take the individual and the institutional competence into account. So you should do that what is safe and what is, in your opinion, best for the patient. But I think both techniques should be experienced and sh should be handled if you have some intraoperative surprises. The tumor is longer than expected. You have a... Um, complicated habitus with a high diaphragm and you cannot reach the upper um, limit from the tumor from the abdomen, then you must be experienced that you can change during the operation to the esophagectomy. So um, thank you very much for your attention. This is a picture of Cologne and whenever you're in the region, you're highly kindly welcome to visit us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Florian Gavir. Uh, you have nicely described two different choices that one can have in a sewer type 2. Uh, but is there any question? Because already time is over, but uh, still we have any one or two comments. Yeah, Dr. I, Ramesh. I enjoyed your presentation. Uh, thank you. I have three questions. The first is, uh, um, what is your best method, method of assessing a minimum margin in the proximal margin when you do an extended gastrectomy? Palpation, frozen section? and what is your minimum centimeters? Um, because often we find that there is submucosal spread, but nothing in the mucosa. Second is that uh, if you have a tumor which is extending higher up, but then we haven't done a thoracoscopic esophagectomy, planned it in that case, uh, your technique is to use an Orwell, or do you, what do you do? How do you uh, actually do the esophageal jejunostomy, mm. or do you have another trick up your sleeve? Thank you for the questions. Um, indeed, this is the, the key question, how to decide where to transect the esophagus intraoperatively. So um, in doubt, we always do a um, on-table endoscopy, and we choose at least two centimeters visual distance between the upper limit of the tumor and the transection. And then we always do a frozen section as well. What we said, there is some mucosal um, tumor growth, so um, we do both. Um, ju not just per patient. I think this is not safe. Um, we don't use the oval. We don't have good experiences with that. We always try to put a hand soon suture. Um, if this is not possible due to technical reasons, we change to the transthoracic approach. Any any comment or question? Otherwise, maybe you, I cannot. Yeah, please. Yeah, Florian, uh, because in Germany you are the highest, uh, the largest center with the highest volume, um, you have 
outlined the problem with the staging, especially with endoscopy and CT. We cannot rely on. So, how? What is your standard approach in G or supposedly G2 tumors? Is laparoscopic exploration justified because you still won't be able to judge if it is a type 2 or a type 1 tumor? And the second question is if interoperatively you find out you have to switch to another surgical approach, uh, let's say you have planned extended gastrectomy but you then decide to go for esophagectomy, would you do a transhiatal resection or would you uh, change your uh, to, to transthoracic approach? Yeah, thank you. So. Um, the problem is the most patients we get referred after near advanced therapy just for operation. So we don't see only uh, we do see only minority of patients before treatment. So the staging laparoscopy is mostly too late. Then um, we do it whenever we have evidence of peritoneal carcinomatosis in the CT scan. Otherwise, not. Um, so we won't use the. The, the blind dissection with the cervical anastomosis. We always change then to a transthoracic approach. Um, we always start during the operation just, the, the first thing is to transect the esophagus to see if we get clear there before we start anything with the stomach itself that we are um, always safe that we can do a gastric pull up. So um, then we are safe, but then we change to put this patient on the side and do a transthoracic approach. Uh, doctor, you, earlier you said that you do hand sewn anastomosis. No, no, uh, uh, that's not correct. We, we do the hand sewn um, 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 suture for the, for the oval then, but um, we, um, for the, for we, we do a circular ana stapler anastomosis. But we do not transect the, stap um, the esophagus with the stapler. We do not do, do, we do, not do double stapling. So the, the, and then and it was not clear. No, 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 no hand soon anastomosis.